Folks, good evening and uh, welcome uh, to our evening service tonight. Welcome to the Burkhead Free Church building. Uh, my name's Peter. I'm the minister here in Burkhead. Um, this, of course, is a, a joint service, though, uh, not just for folks here, but with our friends in Elgin Free Church as well. So uh, if you belong to uh, either one of those congregations um, or neither one of those congregations, um, welcome. Uh, it's great to have you with us. Um, we're starting this new series of evening services looking at Christian doctrine. Um, that is, we're looking at the whole of the Bible and asking, what does God tell us um, about important topics that relate to him and the world he's made and the people that we are? Um, I'll be speaking uh, tonight, and um, you might like to head on over now to burkheadfreechurch.org forward slash Sunday service um, there you can get a handout which relates particularly uh, to this service tonight. And it will probably help you um, to have that with you if you haven't got it uh, already. So you might like to get that just now. There's a link you can click uh, to download that. Uh, not much to announce, really. Often I would give announcements about things happening in the life of our church. But perhaps I can just say, if you're part of the Burghead congregation... If you're at that page, burkheadfreechurch.org forward slash Sunday service, you can also download our morning service sheet, which as usual has information about all the things that are happening and access codes for various uh, online Zoom meetings. For Elgin Free Church, uh, just a reminder from Colin um, that you'll be meeting for prayer on the first and third Wednesdays of the month. Um, but again, uh, head on over to elginandforestfreechurch.com uh, where there's uh, always up-to-date information. You can check out uh, either of our social media feeds as well to find out more. Uh, don't forget as well that after this service tonight, there's a time of fellowship uh, for our two congregations together um, on Zoom. That's at 7 p.m. And uh, you should have had the, the codes emailed to you for access. Um, if you haven't, um, if you head to, again, elginandforestfreechurch.com, uh, you'll find them there. Uh, these evening services are, are going to follow a, a format uh, where we sing and pray and read the Bible and then hear the Bible taught. Uh, so all of those things will happen. We'll have various members uh, from our churches to pray and to read and so on. Uh, tonight, though, we're going to start with uh, a song. Uh, these words are based on Psalm 62. Uh, My soul finds rest uh, in God. So let's sing and praise our God together. My soul finds rest in God alone My rock and my salvation A fortress strong against my and hearts make us and lies like arrows pierce me I'll fix my heart on righteousness I'll look to him who hears me Oh, praise him hallelujah my delight and my reward heaven Never failing my redeemer. 
I'll set my gaze on God alone and trust in Him completely. With every day, pour out my soul, and He will prove His mercy. Though life is but a fleeting breath, a sight to breathe, to measure. Let us come to God in prayer. David writes in the opening of Psalm 16, Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. How we long to have faith like David, Lord, who consistently turned to you in times of fear and worry and in times of uncertainty. Father, we read his words at a time when most of us find it hard to feel joy and hard to express our hope. We feel worn down, Lord, losing encouragement as our own governments and other leaders around the world are scrambling to make decisions as we hear of thousands of people getting sick and dying of this pandemic. Although in Murray the numbers remain comparatively small, Lord, we live in fear that more and more of us will lose loved ones and people we know and will be unable to even attend funerals. We already know so many who are learning to cope because they've been left without a job and their income has been taken away. Lord, we cry to you and ask for an end to this suffering. For we know in the midst of it all, you are sovereign over all these things. We know amongst the uncertainty, there is still joy. There is joy in our salvation. There's joy in the fellowship of believers, even if remotely. There's joy in your word. So, Father, we want to rejoice in those things. We want to not become saddened and overwhelmed by the grief and sadness taking place in our world. But we want to look at it through the lens of your word and with gospel eyes. Lord, show us where we can help. Our focus this evening is God speaks. Lord, we ask earnestly that we listen as you do. As we listen to Peter, let us hear you. Let us know you better so that we will know better what it is you call us to. And Lord, we confess there are things you would desire to call us away from too. Things of this world that have become too precious for us. We pray for wisdom and discernment upon all of us. And especially for our leaders as they make decisions that affect everyone at this time. As we pray under the authority of your word that you speak to us, let us make the right decisions during these times and use our roles for your purpose, your will and not our will be done. David finishes his psalm, Lord, with these words. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Lord, thank you. Thank you. You are the same Lord that David could trust in and rely upon to secure his hope. You are the same Lord that all those suffering today can call on for rest. The sick, the lonely, the elderly, the sad and the broken. Speak to them, we pray, through the power of your Holy Spirit. And those who are far away and don't listen, send us, Lord. Give us words to speak of your love and the salvation promised in the name of Jesus. 
It's in his mighty name we pray. Amen. A reading is taken from the book of Psalms and from Psalm 19, a psalm that speaks both about the revelation of God in the world around us and as he speaks to us in the word that he's given to us. So let's hear the word of God. Psalm 19, for the director of music, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May, not, may they not rule over me. Then will I be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. And this is the word of God. Well, thank you, uh, Colin, for reading and Paul for leading us. I'm looking forward very much to these next few weeks uh, studying doctrine, but I think there are two questions that you might be asking at this point. Firstly, what do we even mean by doctrine? Well, our normal practice here would be to work through books of the Bible, Sunday by Sunday. But now and again, it's good to step back a bit and ask, what does the whole Bible teach us about a particular subject, uh, like creation or, or Jesus or the church? Finding out what to believe about these subjects, well, that's doctrine. But your second question might be this, will this be a bit dull? Well, the answer is absolutely not. If you are following Jesus, what greater task is there than learning the things he wants us to know? And what could be more practically useful? Now, it can take work and study and concentration to understand scripture, but the Bible is never just some academic textbook. Because we believe it's God's word, studying it carefully will always bring application for real life. That's why we've called this series Doctrine, Foundations for Real Life. Now we've got a wealth of, of speakers and topics uh, lined up in this great series. And we're really pleased to be doing this jointly with our friends in Elgin. As I said, you also should have a handout for this service sheet, which you can get online. The handouts are, tonight especially, it's essential. If you can get a hold of that, burkheadfreechurch.org forward slash Sunday service, then, then please do. You can use it to take notes, um, and I recommend that you do take notes. If you did that every Sunday night uh, throughout this seven or eight week series, uh, then you will have a great set of notes compiled on really important topics, which I think will help you for the rest of your days. 
Uh, we do have 17 sessions planned uh, in this, uh, in this uh, series, but we've, we've, we've limited that to seven or eight, and we'll maybe revisit this again in the future to do the rest. There is a full list of the topics we're going to cover uh, in your handout. You'll see that the topic today is Scripture, God Speaks. We're thinking about the Bible. What is it? Why is it so important? And we're starting there because that gets us right to the heart of what is probably the most important question in life. Can we know God? And if so, how? Well, that question is our first point tonight. Can we know God? If so, how? That is not just a question for the armchair philosophers among us. It's not just a question for blokes sipping pints in the pub having speculative chat with too much time on their hands. If God is real, and we're convinced he is, then is there really any bigger or more practically relevant question than who is he, what is he like, and what does he require of us? Now, of course, if we were sitting drinking pints in the pub or or shooting the breeze with our friends, asking what is God like, well, there would be plenty of people with an opinion to share. Those opinions, of course, would be purely shaped by our own minds and perhaps by our culture around us. And I dare say if you spoke to someone who who grew up in a different culture, maybe in Vietnam, they might have a different picture in their mind of God than someone who grew up in Vienna. So how can we possibly know who's right? Well, the answer is we can't. It's all just endless human speculation Unless God chooses to reveal himself to us. To put it another way, we need objective revelation from God, not just subjective speculation from us. So how has God revealed himself? Well, in two main ways. We call them general revelation and special revelation. Revelation. I should say, as we uh, study doctrine, um, it's going to be a bit like the, the, the COVID pandemic in the sense that we're going to learn some new words. A year ago, who would ever heard of social distancing or AstraZeneca? These are words, language that we've learned. Well, we're going to have the same experience. We're going to learn some new terminology. General revelation and special revelation. Here's the first way. This is heading to now. God makes himself known by general revelation. We read Psalm 19 earlier, and we're going to get back to that in a moment. But first, here's a verse from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. The writer there says, God has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. That's what we might call, letter A, internal revelation. Or immediate revelation. So since we are made in God's image, there's something deep down inside of us, even if it's buried quite deep or or suppressed quite hard, that knows that God is real, that, that seeks for something beyond ourselves. The theologian John Calvin said it this way, there is within the human mind And indeed, by natural instinct, an awareness of divinity. This we take to be beyond controversy. God himself has implanted in all men a certain understanding of his divine majesty. Or in other words, as Ecclesiastes says, God has placed something of eternity, some albeit limited knowledge of God within us. So next, under this heading of general revelation, we have letter B, revelation through creation. Now we get to Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. And on goes the psalm. The first half of that psalm essentially says that we can know some things 
not everything, but some things about God through the world he's made. Now, that makes sense, of course. You can tell something about an artist by looking at their artwork. For example, some, uh, looking at something that I had painted would tell you that I wasn't a very good painter. The opposite, of, of course, is true with God. As we look at the vast scale and the awesome complexity and the beauty of his creation, well, the, the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans says it like this. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Someone in the church family here in Burkhead texted me the other week and they said, and I quote, I'm watching Perfect Planet on the BBC. How anyone thinks this is by chance is beyond me. And that text is, is basically a summary of what Paul says in Romans. God's eternal power, his divine nature are clearly seen from what has been made. That's general revelation. There's one more brief point here before we move on. Revelation, let us see, through God's providence. Now, providence just means uh, God being in charge, him controlling and directing events in the world. And sometimes that might tell us something about God. So, so maybe, for example, I pray and I see God bring a, a real visible answer in that way. Or maybe I just have a sense of, of God directing the events of life. That might tell me something about God. So we have some inner sense of eternal things. We can see something of God's power in creation. And we may see something of God uh, in his work in the world around us, his providence. But, but, there's a problem with all of that. It gives us a general taste of God, but it doesn't tell us much that's specific. And to make it worse, we cannot work out the details ourselves because we are too lowly and God is too awesome and because we are too sinful and he is too pure. So we need more revelation. We need God to speak we need his word if we're going to get to specifics. Here's how the Westminster Confession of Faith summarizes what we've said so far and this problem that we face. Although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men inexcusable, yet are they not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and of his will which is necessary unto salvation. Do you see? And can you see that, that if, as we believe, the Bible is God's word, if it is that specific communication that we need, then the Bible is totally brilliant and absolutely crucial. See now why Psalm 19 has these two parts. The first part, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. But then verse 7, the law of the Lord, that is his specific written word, is perfect, refreshing the soul. And so point three today, God makes himself known by special revelation, what we often call scripture. The Bible. So we come at last to the Bible. We're going to ask this question. Scripture, what is it? So, letter D. Scripture is God speaking. Now, it ought to be obvious from Psalm 19 that Scripture is God speaking. The Psalm calls Scripture the law of God, the statutes of God, the commands of God. And, of course, those are all things that you give when you speak. And, and then they are written down. Another verse that will help us is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, which says, All scripture is God-breathed 
and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, sometimes, and in some translations of the Bible, rather than using this phrase, God breathed, we say that the Bible is inspired by God. But that can be a bit misleading. For a start, we we might just think that means the Bible is inspiring, which is true, but that's not really the point here. Or we might think that that God inspired the Bible uh, just as I was inspired to write rock music after listening to ACDC on repeat. The reality is my song would be a poor imitation of the real thing. But the Bible is not a poor imitation of what God intended to say. The Bible is not just loosely inspired by him. In fact, the actual word in the original language is more like expired or exhaled. Scripture is breathed out by God, which means that what you have on the page is exactly what God intended. Now, you might reply and say, well, okay, but hang on a minute. Doesn't the Bible have human authors like Paul or Luke or Isaiah or whatever? And of course, that's right. So you might ask, well, how does it work? How does God breathe out the Scriptures And yet, at the same time, they're written by people. The answer is in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, which says, For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. I wish we had more time to spend on that verse. You could perhaps reflect more deeply on it later. For now, just notice that God, by his Holy Spirit, moved these authors to write as they did. So the Holy Spirit of God and the Word of God always go together. Sometimes you hear people say, oh, oh, is that a spirit-filled church or a Bible-teaching church? And the answer is that's a totally ridiculous question because you cannot have one without the other. Because the scriptures were breathed out by God, by his Holy Spirit. And because that's true, the next conclusion is obvious. The Bible comes with God's power and authority. For example, when Paul is writing to the Thessalonian church, he says, We also thank God continually... Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from it from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but but as it actually is, the word of God. Sadly, it's not uncommon today to see people or whole churches who say they follow Jesus, but who seem to be much more influenced by the views or opinions of our culture than they are by the Bible, by God's words. Can you see, that's not a small thing. That's a serious problem. And we do live in a day when we need to be prepared to bear the cost for sticking with the authority of the Bible, even if that brings us out of step with the views of our culture. Anyway, next, letter E. Scripture is essential to know God Truly, although not completely. Again, it should be obvious. If if scripture is God's word, it comes with his authority. And then, then of course, that means it's the key way that we can know him. And that's not a small thing. It is a glorious reality that we can know God. It's worth pointing out, of course, that that you can know someone truly without knowing them fully. Think about my kids. They know me truly. It's not some different version of me they know. They know the real me. But they don't know me exhaustively. There's lots of reasons for that. One of them is because in some ways they're too young to understand everything about me. The same is true in a much bigger way when it comes to what Scripture reveals to us about God. The Bible is essential for knowing God. In it, he reveals truths about himself 
that he has decided we need to know. But of course, we tiny, finite creatures could never know God fully or exhaustively. Which does mean that scripture may not always answer every question that we might have. But it does give us what we need. Speaking of which, perhaps most importantly, it tells us what we need to know about being saved and included in God's family. So letter F, scripture is essential for salvation. The Westminster Confession that I've already quoted goes on like this. Although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men unexcusable, yet are they not sufficient to give us that knowledge of God and of his will which is necessary unto salvation. So the confession goes on, therefore it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in diverse manners to reveal himself and to declare that his will unto his church in other words one of the main purposes of the bible and definitely the big theme of the whole story of the bible is God's plan to save his people through Jesus that is woven onto every page every page plays its part in that big story which is why when we preach from any part of the bible we're always asking how does it teach us about Jesus and what he did for us through his death and resurrection. So scripture is essential for salvation, but also, letter G, it's essential for our comfort, protection, direction, and growth. Our relationship with the Bible doesn't stop when we come to know Jesus. Of course, quite the opposite. It's essential for our Christian growth. The Westminster Confession goes on, and afterwards, for the better preserving and propagating, that means spreading of the truth, and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and of the world. So the Bible and the power of the Holy Spirit who inspired it, inspired it, this is God's tool to, to teach us and shape us and change us and comfort us and protect us and nourish us in our faith. Which begs the question, do you know the Bible? Are you reading it? Are you drinking it in? You, you need it. Another way of saying that is letter H, scripture is sufficient for us. This is so key, and this last point I think may be one of the most important. It's certainly one of the most neglected. Here's another helpful verse, 2 Peter 1 verse 3. God's divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory. And goodness. Notice there that it's our knowledge of God which gives us all we need to live a godly life. And that knowledge we've seen comes through the Bible. In fact, the context there in 2 Peter is about uh, God's word. Or again, back in 2 Timothy 3 16, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correct, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The point in these verses is that God, through the Bible, gives us everything we need to live the Christian life. The Bible is what we need to be, quote, thoroughly equipped to live for him. Again, don't take my word from it. Look back at that revealing verse. What equips us for every good work? It's scripture. So we don't need to chase other forms of revelation. The Bible is not lacking. God himself says it's sufficient. Again, the Westminster Confession of Faith sums this up well. All of this, 
maketh the Holy Scripture to be most necessary. Those former ways of God's revealing his will unto his people being now ceased. In other words, we don't need to go around or chase around today looking for a prophet. Not in the Old Testament uh, understanding of that word anyway. I think it's important to say that because sometimes we read the Old Testament, like we're doing in our morning series here in Berghead at the moment, looking at 1 Kings, or in other places too, and we see there that there are prophets who speak the word of God. The prophet speaks to the king, for, for example. It's easy to, to read that and think, oh, I wish I lived back then. You know, it, it was so much better then. Or well, not at all. It's us who live in the most privileged time, the, the privileged position. Because we have everything that God has planned to say in our hands. And God himself says, this is sufficient It's what we need to be thoroughly equipped. God speaking by his word in the power of his Holy Spirit. That's why the Bible is at the heart of our church life in our congregations. That's why knowing it and reading it and perhaps memorizing parts of it is at the heart of what we encourage you to do. You may know that we in Berghead have a a vision as a church to grow, to be a vibrant, all-age church of 100 disciples. I'm sure you in Elgin will have similar hopes and desires, and if you're watching from another congregation, I'm sure you may have your own statements like that as well. I mention that because it's, it's very easy when you have a vision like that to start thinking of, of all the other things that we must do to grow God's church. You know, we must run this club or do this thing or have that ministry or we must do the publicity or have this kind of social media presence. Now listen, all those things have their place and and can be important, but ultimately we need to know none of those things will grow God's church. None of them. No, God grows his church through his word, in the power of his spirit. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. So the fact that we as churches make a big deal about reading from the Bible and preaching from the Bible, and you'll notice when we're preaching, we are constantly referring back to the text. Do you see what it says in verse 15 and, and so on? The fact that we even sing from the Bible when we sing the Psalms. The fact that we, we speak so often for our need to read and study and know the Bible, the fact that we open up the Bible in our small groups and in our prayer meetings and all the rest of it, it's not as if we've sort of made a choice and said, oh, um, we'd, we'd, we'd kind of like to be that style of church that does that sort of thing. No, God himself has said that his word brings faith and grows our faith, nourishes our faith. God, through his word, in the power of his spirit, will grow his church. The Bible, if you like, is is the tool or the weapon that we have to use in this task. In fact, the Bible itself refers to itself as the sword of the spirit. The Bible is the weapon that we wield as we go about the task we've been given of making disciples. If you remember nothing else, remember that. There's so much more that could be said. There are so many other questions that you might have. You can feed them into me in one way or another, and we can talk about them more. But I hope that helps you. I hope it helps you to see how much we need God's word, how precious it is, what a gift it is to have in our hands, that it is truly all we need for life and godliness and all that our churches need to carry out our mission. Let's pray together. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, how we thank you that you've spoken, that we can know you, that whatever controversies or confusions we may have, that you have spoken. We pray, Lord, that you would um, help us to, uh, to take great delight in your word, to read it, to mark it, to learn it, to inwardly digest it. And Lord, we pray in our congregations that your word, in the power of your spirit, would do its work. Lord, as we read it and speak of it and preach it, we pray that um, that faith would come as many hear the good news of Jesus spoken from the scriptures. We pray it all in Jesus' name. And we pray too that the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit would rest upon us and remain with us this night and forevermore. Folks, thanks so much for being with us for this uh, first one of our new evening uh, service series. Come back next week. We'll be here, same time, same place. But don't forget, uh, uh, in just a few minutes' time, at 7 o'clock tonight, we meet for a time of fellowship on Zoom. Hope to see you there. God bless. Take care. My soul finds rest in God alone, my rock and my sound.